Today we're going to be doing some modding. Today you'll have a taste of what it's like to work on a Brazilian bike. This behind me is a Honda CG 150 from 2012. So, so right off the bat the specs are, this is a fuel injected bike. It's flex fuel, so it will run with any mixture between E25 and E100. That's right, it will run with anything of a mixture from 25% from 25% ethanol to 100% ethanol, neat ethanol. It, and it will do that automatically. All you have to do is just fill it up and it'll work. It will adjust itself to, to run properly with whichever mixture you choose to, to fill it with. So specs right, right off the bat. This is a 14.2 um, horsepower engine at the crank. It produces pretty much nil of torque. It produces almost no torque given that it produces these 14.2 horsepower at 8500 RPM. So it's not a whole lot. I'll put it on the video. However, the actual value, uh, the actual torque that it makes. But this is a simple uh, overhead cam two valve engine uh, with a timing chain. It's, it's as simple as that. Original piston is a 57.3 millimeter piston and originally it has nine and a half to one compression ratio. The modification which I'm going to do today, I'm going to increase the compression ratio from nine and a half to one to 11 to one. Now the reason why I'm going to do that is because here, uh, neat ethanol, we have neat, et neat ethanol at the pump. So I can just drive into a gas station and just Fuel my bike with straight neat ethanol out of the pump. It's it's something that's that's been in Brazil since forever, and it's it's quite nice. So the standard gasoline that we have is E25, and then we have the regular E25, and then uh, top tier E25, which has additives, you know, to clean the engine theoretically, and then we have pure ethanol. And as a matter of fact, many cars, many Brazilian Brazilian cars from the uh, from the 70s all the way up to the 90s. Uh, they were released in two versions. You could walk into a, dealer, into a dealership and choose whether you wanted to buy a gasoline-only model or a uh, ethanol-only model, which is something that's that's been with us since forever. And many of these cars are, are still running. Many of them are GM imported Opels, so O or Opel, you know that German um, automaker. So many of the cars that we have here from GM, all the way. From all the way back from from the 70s all the way to the 90s and even into the 2000s because you got the Corsa C even. So all of these cars, that's a, that's a tangent I know but it's just to explain to you that many of these cars were imported, were basically nationalized from Germany, from Germany to here and then they were uh, modified and tuned to basically have gasoline only and ethanol only versions. And then once, starting at around 2003, cars started to receive fuel injection, fuel injection with flex fuel capability, then this was simply not needed anymore. That was a long tangent. But anyway, what we're, what we're going to do here today is, this generation of bike was released back in 2006 by Honda. So this is a fuel injected flex fuel 150cc bike. And basically it's, um, the economy that it gets is it's it's quite fantastic. I mean, I can get about 52 kilometers per liter on E25, and I can get about 38 kilometers per liter on neat ethanol. But if you consider the price difference between these two fuels at the pump, 38 kilometers per liter on ethanol is not. I mean, it doesn't even break even. I'm I'm making a loss by by feeding with ethanol. It's just seasonal things. And just as I say that, a course of be just passes passes in front of my house. So it's just a seasonal thing. Uh, ethanol right now is not completely advantageous to to run against gasoline. So, but because of the heat here, I noticed that when I feed this with E25, when it gets too too hot, it starts to ping slightly. Very likely because of the amount of carbon that's built that's built up inside that engine. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the cylinder and piston kit to increase the compression ratio from nine and a half to one. That would be the standard cleaned engine with no carbon in it. From nine and a half to one to eleven to one, and run it on E100 on pure straight neat ethanol. That's what I'm going to do, and I'm going to show you how, what the kit 
looks like. Since to all of you who have taken apart a bike engine before, you all know that the bike engine is basically divided into three parts. It's the engine block, the cylinder assembly, and the head assembly, or the cylinder head. So what I'm going to change today is I'm going to change the cylinder, the cylinder assembly and the piston. And the piston that it's got in here is it's not quite a flat top piston yet because the original piston in this is a, con is a concave piston. So the piston that we're going to install there is not quite a flat top piston, but it's got much more, much more crown material than the, the piston that's in there. And that's where the uh, increase in compression ratio is going to come from. But anyway, this is not an OEM kit by any stretch of the imagination, however I wish. This is a Chinese made one. The reason why any Chinese manufacturer would even, would even consider making a standard kit for increasing the compression ratio boggles my mind because it, it just doesn't make any sense. Most of like 98% of people who take this engine apart to increase anything in it, they mostly increase the displacement. They go from 150 to 170 or 150 to 190 and then they put some very, very aggressive cam on it, a huge carburetor, or they uh, put in a uh, specially tuned uh, module to... Uh, sometimes you can pretty much double the, the power output of this bike just by doing that. From 150 to 190, aggressive cam profile and porting the heads. Porting the heads, with that I mean just a polishing job on the heads, on the, on the intake runners. So, intake runners, you get the point. That's all we're going to do today. The most time consuming process of, of this part would be if I had to remove the old gasket from the bottom of the, of the cylinder because the gasket that goes in here, this bike is t has 10 years of use. It's got 60 original, it's got the, um, I, well I got it with 49, 49,000 kilometers, now it's, it's touching up on 60 so that's quite, that's how much I, I rode it in three months. If I had to remove this bottom gasket from the cylinder, it would be, I mean, I, I did it last week to a friend's bike that's exactly the same as mine, and it took me a solid four hours to remove this gasket from down here because it includes a lot of sanding. A lot of sanding and going at it with a razor, try to, trying to uh, scoop it out. But it, basi it, it basically, the paper gasket just mates to the metal surface and it's, it's gone. So. Good luck with that. I mean, it's gonna take you a lot of hours. Unless you have a lathe, then you could just put this on a lathe and, and you know, do exactly what they did here. See the spirals, if you can tell. <laughs> so anyway, since this is all brand new, I'm not gonna have to waste my time removing a gasket. This one doesn't need a complete full disassembly of the body kit like the older bike did. Uh, I just have to take the, the uh, both of the uh, side covers from this bike and it, it all comes apart very, very easily. Ah, this is not going to be fun. The problem with these side panels is that the pin that holds them onto the fuel tank is very, very brittle. So if you just pull the, the, the panel out, it will break the pin. So I've got to push it out of the... i got to push it out of its bushing before I before I do that because otherwise it will break. Hopefully that's it. See, this one's already glued up and it's fractured. So if I keep on pulling it, it's gonna sever off like it did before and someone already glued it in place. And this one I have personally glued it back together with super glue in and sodium bicarbonate. Ugh. Yeah, that's the terrible part, so these will be rusted shut. Yeah, so it is. Yes. So. The good part about me doing this now is that since I just took a took apart a bike like this to the same to the same parts that I'm gonna do now last week, is that I already know what to take out so that I don't get I, I don't get hung up. That's something that happened last week. I mean, I didn't know which parts to take out and they were just in the way. So so that's that's the O2 sensor. That's the oil temperature sensor. The reason why I'm taking all these external parts before I even crack open the uh, valve cover is cuz if I don't do this now, I risk dumping a bunch of dirt inside the engine. 
that's the uh, connector for the here it's called a uh, I'm gonna have to translate this myself but this is a this is something I would term a uh, compound sensor unit or combo sensor unit combined sensor unit because here in this connector that I, connector that I just took out we have the map sensor the TPS sensor and the air intake temperature sensor it's all into this one connector here to the side you can see the idle valve actuator we can go ahead and disconnect that not that it's going to make much of a difference and now I have to basically pry this thing out of there Okay, that is it. This is this this thing is glued in place. Oh, oh wow, that's holy moly, that's full of carbon. Way more than I was anticipating. Oh boy. Okay. That's resonating good. So that that's the fuel injector off. The ring is stuck. And that's a whole lot of dirt. <laughs> I'll really have to, to make some strides to clean it up because it's too bad for me to just simply put it back in there. Yeah, that ain't looking pretty. Cool. Yeah, like, this this bike was having some difficulty starting. Maybe now I know why. The fuel injector doesn't look pretty either. That's the fuel injector. It's a cute, tiny little fuel injector, but even it is not looking good. So I'll have to try and clean it up. Some people I've worked with cr criticize me for doing this, but I am, I'm an advocate for, advocate for clean hands while you're uh, working on stuff, because Less dirt means lower possibility for things to go wrong. So that's why I love cleaning my hands all the time. This cover I have already removed like last month to do a, a, a valve lash adjustment because it was too tight. It was, it was too loose, sorry. Too tight would be the other bike, but it was too loose. So the valve lash was too wide and it was it it's it was sound it was sounding basically like a sewing machine. So, so this should come out real easy. I'm gonna do something that's gonna help me now, which is I'm gonna remove this spark plug. This engine is fully stock. It has never been opened from the uh, from the valve cover down. That's running lean as hell. But that's just fuel injection for you. The engine is pretty much made to run like that. So now we gotta loosen up these these guys right over here. I gotta manage to remove this tensioner right here behind the cylinder. The reason why I gotta remove this and not simply just remove the tension is because I'll have to remove this anyway. The reason the reason being that we'll change the cylinder. So the cam chain tensioner is attached directly to the cylinder and it tensions exactly what it says it, it does. Now this is a bit of a nerve wracking part of the, of the job because this could go very wrong if I'm not prepared. And it goes like this. The engine right now is at top dead center. And we've got both screws of the uh, cam of the cam gear loose. So I'll have to remove both of these screws and I gotta put a piece of paper in, in, this, in this area to catch the screws if they fall out of my finger because they're tiny and they can just simply slip out and disappear into the engine. So we got to put a piece of paper down here to catch them if, if they come out of my hand. I have done this before and it's not fun. It can cost you this little adventure it can cost you an additional like four hours if you don't have the proper tools or the knowledge to do it. We'll have to remove timing chain gear. And then now finally we can start if that doesn't fail, we can start taking apart the actual engine. 
because right now all we need to do is just come here with this 12 and loosen up the studs. Uh -huh. Oh, that stud is help. It always is. That this side, which is the cold side of the cylinder, because that's where the the cam chain is, that ensures that this side seals up with the gasket. That's why these two are here. We call this this part the tower. Many people call this the cage. If you really want it to come off, it will, but we usually take it off because we've got to make up clearance for everything else to come out of the head, for everything else to come out of the, uh, <laughs> out of the frame, sorry. So we need to remove this to make up some, some room. Now we can just wiggle this out to freedom. There we go. Holy moly, that's a whole lot of carbon. And tis born. And last time what happened, this is the actual part of the tensioner that, that uh, the tensioner pushes on this, on this guide. And this guide is what actually tensions the chain. So what happened last time is that this little feller broke broke up into a bazillion pieces because this is like a bakelite or a plastic and it dried up. Yeah, and that wasn't fun. So this is the gasket that I was talking about. If I want to remove this gasket from the bottom to replace it, this will take me four or five hours to remove. So it's, it's a lot of time. This is the part that I hate the most about engine building is the, it's the part where stuff can go horribly, horribly wrong. It can ruin your day. It will ruin your day. So I like to prevent this as much as possible. So I, I'll have to grab myself. I mean, I can use a whole bunch of, oh, these are the actual C-clips. Oh my God, these are the worst. I'll have to uh, rotate its opening into the slot that's, into the, that's in the piston so I can access it. I'll, uh, I'll try to uh, keep my finger in here because this can, this can go flying. That's why I prefer the other clips. Oh, got the bitch. So this is an actual C-clip. I hate these ones because if they go flying, they, I mean, they don't give, it, give you that much grip. And if they go flying, you are never finding them again. There we go. <laughs> So the piston pin is actually intact. It's uh, it's got a ridge, but it's it's you can barely feel it with your fingernail. That's what it looks like after sixty thousand kilometers on a bike like this, which is usually written to hell. This is terrible. It could be just the carbon buildup, but I'm quite sure that this is this is actual pinging, the pinging that I was hearing when it was getting too warm. And, and I was running on E25. So the skirt itself is, is, is worn, it's worn. And I could hear some of that too, but it's not that bad. I mean, I'm sure if I, if I measure this with, uh, with a tool, it's gonna be certainly within spec because it wasn't even making like a whole, a whole lot of noise. So this is, this is it. And this is how much carbon it's got in the piston. Some of it, yeah, some of it flaked off. But that's how much carbon it's got. It's got like a solid, it's got like a solid half a mil of carbon on top of it. And this is, this is exactly what it looks like. I'm going to grab a um, 93 proof ethanol and I'll see if I can, if I can knock this out of there. If I can, then it's a good sign because I can, you know, do other, do other things. Did I ever tell you the definition of insanity? Did I ever tell you that this is my daily work bike, that I work tomorrow with this bike? So I gotta, I gotta be really, really cold-blooded to do this to a bike that I'm gonna basically have to ride for about 60 miles tomorrow. This engine was running hot, real hot. Can tell that it was running hot simply looking at the exhaust valve. Take a look at that exhaust valve. That was running hot as hell. That's not due to too tight of a, of, of a valve lash like it happened on the other bike that I had, which was a 300cc bike. That ethanol has been sitting for a solid like two minutes. Let's see if anything even comes off. No, not even in the slightest sense. I mean, it doesn't even smudge the paper. That's how caked 
That's how caked this thing is in there. Holy balls. So yeah, it is not a terrible idea to rebuild the upper part of this engine with, with every 50,000 kilometers. So basically now what I have to do is I gotta grab myself a 600 grit sandpaper and give some finish to the uh, to the face of this cylinder head because it will uh, it, it will need it. And yeah, this engine was was not in bad shape, but it was not in good shape either for 60,000 kilometers. Uh, but that's, you well, know, that's to be expected. I mean, you can't win every game. So basically what I'm going to do before I before I clean the, the residue off of this is I'm gonna plug the uh, I'm gonna plug these holes. These are the actual stud holes. I'll plug them up because I don't want dirt and grime building up in, in inside of this. This is something that I did last week. Something that I did last week that something actually that's something I didn't do last week and that's why I'm doing it now because I know I'll have to clean these holes afterwards if I don't do this now. I'll see if I can remove some of this carbon. Or if it's if or if it's too tough. I mean it's wow, well, it's it's way tougher than I was expecting. Oh wow. She that's a lot of carbon. So what I, I did, what in my view would be a pretty decent cleanup, pretty decent job of removing all the uh, residue of the old gasket. Of course, the uh, the cylinder won't need it because it's brand new. But I even went as far as checking the actual. Uh, I basically checked how straight the the face of the cylinder head is, and it's it's practically perfect. I'm not going to have to do anything to it. So I'll just remove this these plugs now. The cylinder the cylinder head is basically ready for another adventure. First things first. I gotta lay down this uh, gasket. And this is upside down. I do believe there's a guide on the bottom of the cylinder. Yes, I need to remove that as well. I'll need that on the uh, new cylinder. Like these guides are pesky because I always forget to put them back. Uh, I think they go only on two sides. Yes, if I'm not mistaken, that's where they go. So we have the C clip, which is the stock one that comes with the engine, and then we have the G clip, which is the one I prefer. I prefer this one a lot better because you can actually you you have something to grab onto. That makes your life a bit safer. The chance of one of these going airborne is a bit smaller. So this is a floating pin engine. That's why we need these uh, clips. They are not that hard to install. However, installing clips in an engine is always a nerve wracking part of the engine building process because it's here that, again, it's here that, that you can basically end your day because if this clip manages to go airborne or God forbid, fall into the crankcase, I'm gonna have to crack this engine open to get it back. So... There. Nice little click. Okay, let me clean this up real quick. I uh, just noticed something. Right in the uh, timing chain well. I'm gonna call it that. It's basically the this machine space where the timing chain runs. There's a bunch of aluminum dust. That's gonna kill an engine. Because I can imagine if this gets into the oil stream, it's gonna wreak havoc. It's gonna sand everything down to smithereens. Can't believe they machined these parts and didn't wash them later. It's a terrible, terrible mistake that could have cost this engine its life. I mean, yeah, it's a Chinese kit. I mean, what what would you expect? This was probably assembled by a 12-year-old at a at some Asian factory obscure at some obscure Asian factory. But yeah, I'm not going <laughs> to I'm not going to let that sit. I mean, some of it will be caught up by the uh, by the uh, centrifugal oil filter that this engine that these engines have. They do not have an, an actual oil filter per se. 
they have a rotating assembly, basically a rotating drum that catches anything that's, that's heavier than the oil itself. So after the oil gets pumped up by the oil pump, it, uh, it gets filtered by, filtered by this rotating drum. And it works. It, it works quite, out, quite well, actually. We uh, usually clean it every time we open up the engine to change the clutch, which we do by opening the engine by this by this side, this uh, lid right here that you see my finger. Yeah, that's a that's a cover. We basically take that cover off and we change the clutch through there. And so every every time we we uh, do a clutch job, we usually take it apart to clean it because it catches a lot of stuff, mainly the clutch material. But anything that's heavier than the oil itself will get caught up in there. Bring down the fire and. This is a part I also hate because, I, I mean, I have already bent rings when doing this before and it's not fun. I was trying to, it was an old engine, an old ass engine with brand new rings. I was trying to install the cylinder back into the, uh, into the piston which is exactly what we do here. We, we uh, bring the, the cylinder to the piston, but I was trying to do that, and one of the uh, lower oil rings caught up on the, uh, on the ridge that's specifically made to, for that to not happen, and I basically bent an oil ring. I had to stop everything I was doing, grab someone's car, and then run to a rebuild shop to buy new rings. And boy, oh boy, it wasn't easy for the guy to sell me a ring kit without a piston because they are usually sold in sets. You know, you buy the piston, you get the rings. But imagine what I was trying to uh, tell the guy, hey, can you please just sell me a ring kit? Because, yeah, and the guy was like, okay, like after 10 minutes of, of talking to the guy into his senses, <laughs> into my senses, so that he could sell me just some rings. Oh man, this is so nerve-wracking. Oh, the tension. This is really tight. This will, uh, this will need to be... And now, we are ready to install the head gasket. We'll bring the uh, timing chain up, pass it through the, the gasket, and then seat it right there and as a matter of fact this would be a great great time to install back the guides you know the guys that we were talking the guides that we were talking about so they will go back in now same thing with screws if these things go down in there they will uh, they will wreak havoc well now that I'm really like Coming back to my senses, this was a good idea, not so much for fuel economy, but a lot for just, you know, just how the engine was was worn down. I mean, I'm expecting it to get a, a mileage increase, but, you know, a fuel economy increase, but if that doesn't happen, I mean, at least I got a new engine, because it, it really was really worn. First, the O2 sensor cable. Uh, hang on. Yeah, there we go. There we go. There it goes. Yeah, I'll just rest it right there because I'll have to uh, come to the other side and lift the timing chain. I mean, it's it's quite tragic because there's so much else to do in this bike in terms of maintenance, and here I am doing something that it, it's it wasn't necessary to do, but like at this exact moment. Fuck, why is this tensioner always in the worst spot it could be? It's like it wants to break. And why tensioner come out of its place? Oh. Okay. Now I gotta give some attention to the uh, cam tensioner. Why is that? Well, it's got a screw. And that screw is going to be locked in tight. So I gotta wake it up with a hammer before I can open up the service screw. And I'll show you what that looks like. Here is the uh, actual tensioner and its gasket. So we'll put in a new one. So this is the actual T 
tensioner. It's got a screw. It's, it's like a service screw. So I'll have to uh, wake it up before before it will come out. Oh, fuck. Did it. That's stripping the actual head. Brilliant. That's exactly what I wanted. And that's not sarcasm. Now this thing has an O-ring in the screw to seal it up. So this, this screw actually doesn't need that much torque. It just, you know, glues itself into place over the years with grime. But this screw doesn't actually need to be that tight. Now that we have tackled this unfortunate part of the process, we can move along. Now, we're going to install the tower back in place. Which is quite simple. Can be done from this side as well. It has its own guides, so all you have to do is just put it in place. And then, then we can put back the pack. And put back the studs. The sack of studs. So, it's basically not torqued down at all at this point. But, I'm going to put the, uh, the screws that go on the other side. These ones have a specific hole that they have to fall into. If we put them in the wrong place, they'll end up in the crankcase. Not really, you can still, you can still uh, save them from their impending doom. I'm doing something that I shouldn't be doing, which I'm trusting 100% on the clearances that were left by the manufacturer. And even then, this is not like a particularly high performance engine, so it's not like, sure it helps, it, it revs to it revs to earth and out, but now I'll start to actually apply the torque that I want this engine to be with. So you know how we basically put this whole engine together and uh, it's gone it's gone out of its uh, top dead center because the moment I descended that cylinder into it, it just, you know, took it out of top dead center. So basically what I'm going to do now, an Allen wrench, this one, knock this open. And using the wheel, I'm going to put this engine into top dead center from this peephole right here. Let's see. Are we past? Yes, we were past. Top dead center. Align the T with the crank with the uh, crankcase, at least with whatever the hell this is. And now we'll put back the uh, the gear for the cam shaft. And the first time you put it, it's not going to be, it's not going to be in, in the spot, so you'll have to move it around. You'll have to move it around the links until you can get it to be flat with this. So as long as, as the, there are two marks in here that you can't see, but as long as these two marks, these two marks are aligned with the rest of the engine, same thing as before, piece of paper. Put it right there. Get the two screws. Just screw them in there by hand. This noise that you're hearing is the uh, electric start gear. Okay, so they're pretty much for the spec. I can hear the, the rings rubbing against the wall which are to be expected because this is all brand new. But now we, uh, we install the cam tensioner. Same thing here, I'll just clean up this surface of, on the cam tensioner. And once we do that, we will turn the engine over a couple times to make sure that the, the new piston will not get into the valves, will not you know, get stuck into anything. It's only after we tension the timing chain.
as with anything in this engine that has a gasket and needs to seal up, we'll tighten it sequentially. It's, it's funny, you take it apart and it comes apart all, all fine and then once you try to screw things back in there, it's like the spot is way tighter so that the wrench you're using simply won't fit. The worst thing ever. Okay, now we got tension. <laughs> what the fuck is going on? I mean, you can even tighten this, tighten this up by hand and it's, it, it will seal, it's not a problem. Now we'll turn the engine over a couple times to make sure that, you know, we, uh, we're not getting collisions. Nope, we're not. That's awesome. Good. So yeah, that's a good thing I checked the, t the timing because that thing is aligned in there, but it's not aligned down there, but by a slit. So it could be by a single tooth. It's dead on the T here, but it's not perfectly aligned in there. So it's basically a retarded one or two degrees. And whenever you retard the, uh, the cam, you gain more bottom end torque, which is fine with me. Maybe that's the whole reason why this bike behave, behaves the way it does. Like it's very torquey for a bike of its size. That's something I noticed with this bike against any other bike of the same displacement. This one is very torquey, but it doesn't rev that high for some odd reason. And I, th I think that's why. So if you look down there, it's, uh, it's dead on the T mark. And I hope it's uh, dead on the T mark, but look how the cam is aligned. It's not, I mean, it, maybe it's just my OCD, but if I advance it a tooth, it's too much. So basically we're pretty much done with this. This also has an O-ring, so it doesn't need to be that tight. Clean my feet. <laughs> the engine is assembled, it turns over. Nothing, nothing is interfering with anything else. So I'll just put this uh, exhaust ring back in there and we can put back the exhaust. Hey, that's, that's bad. Someone stripped this and it wasn't me. I think I'll have to go out and buy two of these. So, uh, I cleaned up the uh, throttle body. I got my 93 proof ethanol and I came here with a uh, very long brush brushed it off and this is the color of the water that came out of it <laughs> and now you'll notice something why is this alcohol reddish because in 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 the United States gasoline is a very very light uh, green color if I'm not mistaken but in Brazil uh, the standard gasoline that we have is red so this is more than likely the coloring that uh, they put in the gasoline and it's stuck to everything inside this throttle body. So cleaned it all up with a brush and um, it doesn't look like good as new but it's very good and I'm quite sure that uh, the computer will be happy with what uh, you know what just happened here. Now I gotta give some attention to the actual injector itself because it's you know its holes are they look plugged but I'm not sure if they are. So I'll clean them, I'll clean it up real quick. The exhaust is back on. Uh, the guy didn't have a new nut for this, but he had an old one that still had its threads. So, you know, he gave it to me, which is nice. Didn't pay anything for it. Put in some, some a dab of oil into the thread to prevent it, the new nut from, from, you know, stripping because the threads are, the threads were rusted. That's why this, it basically ground itself away. So that's that. Let's move on. So this will be its first start. Let's see what happens.
Yeah, it's it's working fine, but it's like the piston noise is just ridiculous. So I'm hoping that this will quiet down. Then if it doesn't, I don't know what's going to happen, but it's not burning oil and it's working fine. So I'll put in some more oil because we're kind of low on it. And then we'll go for a very, very short ride just to see how it responds. Well, I can't believe I committed this, this mistake twice, but I did it. Um, <laughs> I was complaining about the piston noise. What that was, was I forgot to tighten up these two screws and, it w and went for a ride just like that. The cam gear was basically wobbling all over the place and that was causing noise. <laughs> I just tightened it up to its proper spec. Now it's, it's, it's silent again. So the piston is fine. I have committed this mistake once on the CG160 that I had and I was also working through the night trying to, trying to source where the noise was coming from. And it's just that, you forget to uh, tighten these two screws and they will wreak havoc. They will create a, a, a massive noise that is independent of load, independent of RPM. <laughs> it's, it's a ridiculous uh, uh, amateur mistake, but it happens. I really like this bike because it is a lot more serviceable than the uh, CG160 that replaced it because this one has all sorts of engine engineering aids, so to say, that help that help it go back together like flawlessly. Like when I was putting back the uh, the uh, the flange, the boot for the airbox, there are these little like nipples that you can pull out to fill out the space that needs to be filled, and, and it seals up properly. And it's running just fine. No oil leaks, even from the, uh, the uh, rubber gasket, which I have reused. I'm going to keep it for now. Just for, you know, the, the first setup time, I'll have to uh, retorque the, the head after a, a bunch of kilometers because this will, you know, all settle in. And it's all, you know, it's pretty much done. I'll just put all the, uh, the plastic gear back on it and call it quits. Just see what happens next with, in terms of fuel economy and for that I'll make another video maybe next month about the fuel economy that I'm, that I'm getting with this. I don't know if it's going to change too much because there was just so much carbon in the original piston that I doubt it's going to make that much of a difference. But I bet it will. It's quite a bit more, it's, quite, it's got quite a bit more of a hump than this one does. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I'll see you guys next time. Take care.